Okay, so yeah, Freeman River 2023. No uh, sleeping bags, super shelters. And this is the crew. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Loading up for the trip. Turn it on so Adam's getting his bed on the go. Here, and the heat goes up through the plastic. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's a log. Are you gonna drop it? <laughs> <laughs> you you want to put that on now? Nice. Looking for another camp spot. See, I think you're, I think you're going to be falling out there. But, uh... All right, so we're walking along the Freeman River on uh, what I'm calling our advanced winter wilderness skills course. And what makes this a little unusual is we're not hot tenting. We don't have sleeping bags. We don't have a hot tent. We don't have a stove. Instead, we're relying on Morse Kohansky super shelters and fire. Because all these years of me telling people how amazing super shelters are, I've always wanted to have the experience of really putting it to a test on trips and cold weather trips like it is this time. So, that's what this trip's all about. We got two willing uh, people here, Adam and Tim. And we're gonna video capture everything as we go. But uh, it's gonna all be, be all about firewood and can't setting up our camp. A great portion of our time is gonna be spent setting up the camp for the night to get sleep. And our mentor, Morris Kohansky always said, the measure of your skills uh, could be boiled down to how much sleep you're able to get under duress or a survival situation. And that's going to be the case. So we're out here for four days, moving from place to place on the river and building super shelters at each camp spot and putting up enough wood to spend the night. And the sleep is going to be the measure of our success as well. And on top of it, because we're on our trap line, we're also trapping... Uh, setting traps for coyotes and weasels and uh, you know we're doing some bushcrafty cool stuff too we'll be doing this once a year this course so yeah awesome well it's 25 below and of course we're all sweating now that we're walking and pulling <laughs> so gloves off toques off jackets off zippers open just trying to cool off a little bit so we don't get too much sweat and moisture into our clothing. But uh, it sure is pretty out here on the Freeman. We've got coyote out on our bait. I came out a, a day ago and pre-baited with uh, a deer carcass out here. And now we've seen coyotes establish trails into the bait. So now we're going to set up some, some traps. So here's a typical coyote set on a trail coming through. It's 10 to 11 inches off the ground, 11 to 12 inch noose. And we've got uh, the approved uh, Alberta Trapping Standards snare right here with this wire supported above the trail. And all that's left to do is I'll fence this a little bit. Just I'll block this area with some sticks in there just to kind of force the Yodis uh, to put his head through there. So we put a couple of wheels, weasel boxes here too. And they're set 
There's one right in there with the trap inside, a rat trap inside. Because what I'm finding is that when you set bait out for the uh, coyotes, there are bait piles right there. The weasels often come in too because they're also carnivorous meat eaters. We got another weasel box over there. We'll set six or eight coyote traps here and then we're going to head up the Freeman River and we're going to head up that way and go find a camp spot for the night. We're going to camp right up in there. So the thing is with uh, sleeping in super shelters, without a stove, the amount of fire you need firewood you need is big so we're looking for a camp spot that has a lot of dead standing snags uh, trees of good size and there was a blow down here at some point a big wind gust came and it knocked a bunch of trees down that's why it's sparse looking and there is so much wood over there we're basically camping in the middle of our firewood and now the work begins it's two in the afternoon and we have to stop early it's our first night we got to figure out our shelter systems and get our firewood ready for the night uh, if we had a wall tent of course and a stove we'd be worried about stove wood but we could set those tents up darn near anywhere out here and be fine but we've chosen the hard route we're making our uh, super shelters and we need wood and like you can see, look at the wood we have up in this area, accessible. A lot of this is laying down. We'll use it, but we're going to mix it with a lot of, there's a lot of big dead ones. Look at this thing here. This guy is a giant dead one. And we have saws, right? So we weren't completely stupid. We didn't come out here with no sleeping bags and no wall tent or stove without saws because, well, the saws are going to allow us to cut massive logs like these so that we can have a fire that's long burning and we can get rest and sleep all right so in the name of efficiency when you're harvesting uh, boughs for bedding or anything for that matter but in this case for bedding uh, what i did is i i kind of picked the line through the spruce trees and here's here's my line and i'm just wandering down and grabbing the meat and i'm looking for about fingertip to armpit length and I just put my hand on the top of the branch I want, push down and you get a snap, and then zipper out and tuck. And in this fashion, I can move through pretty quickly. And I'm keeping all the tips to one end, tips to one end and stems to the other, bottoms and tops all together at the same. And eventually I get my arm gets too full, I just set them down all side to side. And then after a while, I've collected a series of piles like that, and then when I think I have enough, I'll just grab a stick like this, and I'll just walk my way back to my shelter. So it's all about efficiency. And eventually, if my pile gets so gigantic, I'll just put a log underneath it, and I'll extend my reach so that I can grab a massive size just by using that extra log. And slowly work my way back, and that way, I've made one trip out, harvest, 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 save trees by only taking a few branches off each one, and then all the way back I'm collecting. So every footstep, every hand movement, everything is efficient, and it all has a purpose. You're not wasting any time or energy. So uh, my bed's built anyways, right here. Let me just give it a try, give it a little test run. Time for coffee break, I think. Ah, there you go. That's awesome. Except we didn't hit the cut below it, eh? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Woo! Logs like these will burn and burn and burn for a good long time, allowing a good solid amount of sleep. If you don't have that saw or an axe or the skills to use it, then you're, you're hauling in small wood and you're gonna burn up more energy than this, than using this stuff, this big stuff. You think that's enough wood for the night? I don't think so. 
It's gonna be 30 below tonight. <laughs> we need twice that. Still. Are you doing parachutes too after that? Yeah. Parachute next and then your plastic? Yeah. I don't oh, great. my plastic is long enough, but hey, <laughs> parachute's long enough. Right on, so there it is. So he's got the mylar blanket inside, reflective ceiling, and then a, a parachute covering under there, and then the plastic. Just look, can you lift the plastic up and we'll just look at the parachute, how you got that in there. Yeah, yeah, and the parachute sops up some of the condensation that appears in there from the body, and it allows some fresh air exchange. And then the plastic, when you pull it down, the radiant heat from that fire goes through the plastic and is captured inside in a bubble of warm air. And it's like being in Hawaii on the beach in shorts uh, with bare feet. And even though it's 35,000 below here. <laughs> okay, well that's not quite like that. But it's hopefully gonna get us through the night without sleeping bags. Just in our clothing. Well, we made her through that night. Um, I'm not sure what temperature is yet. I'll have to check here, but it was supposed to hit minus 30 tonight. Or overnight. We'll find out soon enough, I guess. That's what's how much wood we have left. Six of them in the night. That big. That was, that was almost 14 hours. Yeah, freeze log. Yeah. <laughs> Look at this shanty town. <laughs> but we slept. We sure have a big hole here, a big crater. And we burned, you figure, six of them big guys? Yeah. yeah. Burned six of them up. Six of them are burnt up. Yeah. By about eight. This is number seven, I think. It's yeah. Right and there was periods where we all got cold for various reasons. I had to change my shelter a little bit through the night and drop the ceiling and slide the bed closer. When it's this cold, right? Like, First Nations people wouldn't have left their shelter and gone and made new shelters. <laughs> they wouldn't have traveled, they would have hunkered down. Liking where you're going with and they yeah, and they hopefully would have had their winter stores for them, right? And they knew the risks, right? It's tough, and that seems like a bit of a cop out from the goals that you know. Let's let's push this, but at the same time, is it or is it just being smart? We're in a spot where there's an abundance of firewood. We have the food. You should videotape what you're saying right now. I am videotaping. It. Yeah. That's okay, yeah. Yeah, so, right, like, unless we were on an a Arctic expedition or a scientific experiment or across the Antarctic, why would we move? Other than to prove a point that we can move and reset, but uh, it's tiring. It's a, setting up the camp in this, this fashion is exhausting, right? And then last night we made the there is the comments like the truth is if you had a hot tent we'd pull in a spot we could we could choose all of our spots a lot more uh, easily that we're camping and you pop open your hot tent and within probably half an hour you've got your hot tent up and your stove going and people getting warm and drying out and stuff but in this type of camping uh, that doesn't happen because you've got to set up, build a bed, and then get enough firewood to last through the night. Now that's in bitter cold temperatures. If it was a little below zero right now, like minus five, even minus ten, the sunshine right now into our heaters would would almost be enough to keep warm without a fire inside the these little greenhouses, right? It'd be a different ball game. It's just that that cold, cold temperature it makes it. Everything's so much tougher, so. Yeah. I don't think it's a cop-out. I think it's being smart. And, uh, yeah. 
What do you guys think? I want to hear what Adam thinks. You want to hear what Adam thinks? He's, he's, he's made a muscle, this guy. <laughs> I'd be curious to know, uh, traditionally, what the amount of wood trapped in the been by indigenous people. And since I, I've heard accounts of them piling buffalo chips into great piles just to use, but that would be a more plated culture in areas like this. Just to say what effort they put into putting a mass up before it gets cold. Yeah, if hunter gatherer people here in the boreal forest, like they didn't have saws. We have saws, and the amount of work they would have had to do to stay warm, they would have chosen their uh, site selection very carefully. They would have, in the summer months, they would have scouted it probably or knew about it or whatever, and they planned it where there's the maximum amount of uh, protection from the from the elements, potential for food, and firewood, right? Firewood, firewood, firewood. With no saws, they'd have to break and drag everything into their shelters, which weren't super shelters like this, but they were still crude, and they needed the materials to build that too, right? So... I wouldn't see them picking up and moving in the winter. Why would they do that? They'd, they'd break off into smaller family groups and their big gatherings would be in the summer. And in the winter, they'd have to break off into groups so they'd have enough resources to provide for a small group rather than burning up all the firewood all winter long and within five kilometers walk, right? So that'd be tough. Anyways... We're just trying to figure out what we're going to do here. Isn't that pretty? We're going to head out on a walk today. See if we can uh, chisel through the ice, find some water. And we're going to go tracking. What a day. What a day for tracking. We decided we're going to go walking and just kind of explore. at this trail then uh, go through the system of is it a small medium or large animal so just looking at those tracks it'd be in the medium cat uh, category large would be moose deer elk bear that sort of thing medium would be coyote uh, lynx badger those kind of things although badgers are sleeping now but so this is, it's likely a coyote, just because we're on a river and, and they tend to use the rivers as highways all winter. But what, what I wanted to point out here was uh, the gate of this one. And you can start to see when you, when you, somebody points it out or you, or you study it for a bit, you can see groups of four. Right? So here's a group of four. I'm going to go to this side so the battle's not on it. So it starts there. And it ends there. And then there's a bit of a pause right here. And then it's one, two, three, four. It's not a pause, a bit of a break. One, two, three, four, break. And here's the break right here. One, two, three, four. So he's galloping in this case. And it uh, looks to me like it's going that way. So what we would be looking at here is a front, front, rear rear so when that set of four lifted off you can imagine any galloping animal animal they'll have an airborne phase right here where the whole body is leaping lunging forward and then the two front feet come down bang bang but then right here the rear feet have to pass the front feet and there's a second airborne phase right here where the, the rear feet swing past the front feet and then the two rear feet plant like that. So in a galloping gait, we have one air, first airborne phase, second airborne phase where the animal is actually not touching the ground at two different times. And then we've looked on other videos that I've shown, we've, when you have a lope, there's one airborne phase. And when they're walking, there's typically no airborne phase because they're walking one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four with all their feet. 
But anyways, it, it's a gallop. So when you're looking at these things, you have to start looking for groups of two or groups of three or groups of four. And that starts to lead you down the path of what kind of gait it is. Whether it's a trot, a walk, a lope, or a gallop. And uh, yeah, we're, we're just seeing coyote tracks everywhere here. So we'll spend the next few hours uh, ripping around looking at tracks. Got kind of a twisty otter trail here, so slide, run, 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 leap, leap, slide, and then he went off to the left, and went way back over there, and then he ends up coming this way. So this is of interest to us, because it's an otter, right? That's pretty cool. How often do you get to track otters? So I think we'll follow him for a while, eh, and see what he does. We've just spent the last uh, couple hours trailing an otter, which was fun, and now here we're back to seeing our little lynx we've crossed this guy's trail three times and then he comes over here and then here's a couple of coyotes yeah i don't know i'm speculating they are uh they're mating now right so or at least towards the end of mating so is that what that is a little bit of blood the female uh and the and the male maybe or it's a kill i don't, I don't know it's hard to speculate on that but anyways there's our cool little lynx. Where is he? Oh, he goes right onto the logs over there. There he is. Master Tim, working on his ladder. <laughs> He's helping us out so we can get up that bank easier. So I just, I just got to say, Tim was a trooper last night. He kept the fire going kept waking up and stoking it for us and here he is still going what are you are you eating something different or what <laughs> oh, there you go tim finished his little ladder to help us get up the bank to our camp that's up there <laughs> let's try this bad boy out yeah nice we made it up the ladder day two evening yeah that's a log are you gonna drop it <laughs> i guess so <laughs> wow and that fire outside is awesome. We got those big logs on there that we can cut because we have a saw. And uh, we can enjoy two to three hours, sometimes even more, without having to adjust the fire because we have a saw and we can cut giant logs. You know, it's like 27 below outside Celsius. And in here it's above zero modern space age technology with mylar blankets parachute fabric and polyethylene and without that we'd be in lean-tos and we'd have to use even more firewood smoky cold affair <laughs> uh, time for sleep well we made it to day three two nights again last night it was down in the somewhere around minus 28 minus 29 we're not really sure <laughs> i'd have to look on the weather app to find out i guess but now we got snow and we're going to break camp and move on today uh up river down river we're not sure yet but we're going to move so adam's out checking snowshoe hair see if we got any and uh, we set traps for them last night and you can see the ice build up underneath between the parachute <laughs> so the condensation is getting sopped up and moving through the parachute somehow i don't know if it's moving through or what but they're dry on the inside right you guys yeah, I, totally I, dry. All three of us experienced dry on the inside, even though you're sleeping inside a bubble of plastic. The parachute is somehow uh, 
allowing that moisture to go through it and collect on the outside of the parachute. And this is uh, probably the clearest example of that I've ever seen. Let's look into here. Yeah, look at all that. It's all, all ice. So all the condensation wasn't dripping on us or sticking to us, or if you, you know, brushing against it, you don't get soaked. The parachute was uh, sopping it up and moving it away from your body, which is friggin' awesome. Way to go, Morris Kohansky and his, his, uh, the science behind the super shelter. And then there's your, yeah. Is it dry in there? Dry. Yeah, crazy. It was also about plus 40 inside that shelter so at some point you were like almost thinking underwear right like almost going without a shirt yeah so hot yeah at minus 27 at 27 below and plus 27 inside <laughs> awesome all right we're moving to our next camp here and tim's taking his ladder <laughs> And we're off. Alrighty, so this is home for tonight. We found this little spot. Um, we figure there's good mineral soil in this little opening right here rather than organic duffy soil. So that's uh, gonna help us with putting our fire out. And we've got some really big, tall, standing dead ones back. Back there, there's one big, tall, dead one. And right there, there's a giant dead one. And if we're ambitious, if it was really cold, we'd go for that one, but we might be going for the thinner one because it's, it's not so cold anymore. And uh, we got everything we need here. We got boughs plenty for our beds and rails and stuff. And we've even got over here, if we go this way on purpose to bring our gear up, there's a little cliff and we get to use Tim's ladder. Uh, that's going to be awesome. We knew that we needed that ladder for something. Tim's not even here to comment. He's hiding in the bushes back there someplace. He's looking for fungus. <laughs> Tim, we need your ladder. Step one, get the ladder. It's the only it's the only way we can camp here. Yeah, it's your ladder is gonna save our lives. So this is razor strop fungus. Razor strop. You find it grown on birch trees. This is last year's likely, so it's been decayed. It's mm -hmm. lost all of its spore producing body on the bottom, but it's good for treating wounds in that you can cut little strips off it and use it just like a, a band-aid basically. The surface or the just cross section of it? The surface of it, it peels off like a skin oh, okay when it's yep. fresh i should say when it's not dried out like that one when it's like this when it's secondarily rotted it makes a pretty good tinder you can even catch a spark on it from flint and seal if it's in the right condition so razor strop strop is in uh, used in knife sharpening mm -hmm. yeah if you cut it in cross section it's very very finely porous and uh, you can strop on it or even put a uh, polishing compound on it and really get your knife sharp Take the burr off your knife. Yep. Sweet. Only on birch trees or? It's only on birch trees. Okay. Uh, the effort you put into to cutting this, we know that we only need six to seven pieces of this that are as long as the body or even a little less than that we've found. So they're about a meter long. Six to seven of these will burn from seven o'clock at night until the next morning. So in our way of thinking, an, an hour spent chopping this down and sectioning it and hauling it over, just, uh, it's only like 20 steps over there to where our shelter is. That's the way to go. Rather than walking around cutting all this wrist, wrist thick stuff or leg thick stuff and just putting energy into so many trips back and forth, so many cuts, you just go for the big stuff. Yeah, let it rock and then go. Let it rock and then go.
trees in a while, so yeah, I'm excited to get into this one tonight. So the mylar blanket is draped on there. Okay, okay, so now the parachute has been drug over there and it's a triangular piece of parachute. And there we've got the plastic draped over and it's just big enough for one this high. The super shelter is an emergency shelter that works absolutely wonderfully. Like, there's nothing that will beat this type of shelter as an emergency shelter with a fire or a heat source. It's just nothing so simple that works so well. But it's an emergency shelter that you have to have with you and you have to have the training to be able to build. If you don't have, uh, oh, and you need the, the physical skill because there's a lot of work, right? Especially in cold temperatures. So you need the training, you need the materials, you need the physical fitness to be able to pull this type of camping off, which unfortunately knocks a lot of people out of the game because <laughs> it's, it's a challenge. But if you have that training, and if you are smart enough to pack the shelter materials, which pack down very small, into your quad or into your snowmobile or into your vehicle or into your airplane or into your helicopter or into your backpack when you're working in forestry or some remote areas. If you have this with you and you've got that training, you just can't beat this emergency shelter. There's nothing that I can think of that'll save your bacon more in cold temperatures than something like this. Good job, Tim. He's put together our three log fire for the night. What we've got over there, Adam, he's been asleep for a while. And Tim and I are about to go to sleep, so we're gonna hunker down for the night. And so we had a fire in the middle and Tim just brought big log number one, big log number two, and stuck big log number three on top. And he stuffed that full of, uh, of uh, nice, good kindling. And then put spacers in there. There's a little stick in there and a little stick back there. Stick there and a stick there. And the space is to allow the flames to start working their way up and out from the three logs. Otherwise, if they sit right flat, it kind of snuffs it a bit. Anyways, this is going to grow. It's only been on running for, what, a minute and a half, two minutes maybe? Yeah. It'll have this beautiful long ribbon. And the, these three guys will burn. We've been finding that they burn for hours, so... It's so warm in here. I'm down to a t-shirt now. And that fire out there, all those sparks and all that smoke stays out there. It doesn't matter how cold it is outside, you're still warm in here. Yeah, so when you're on a, like on a canoe trip and you pull in in the afternoon off of a river, you have to cook, set up camp and cook meals. And that's going to take probably an hour to two hours. And if it's raining, it might take longer because you're setting up a tarp town and you're messing around and then you crawl into sleep. If you're hot tenting, you stop in the afternoon before it gets dark. And in the winter, we have less daylight. So you're, you know, you're stopping earlier than you would with canoeing. And with a hot tent and a group of people, it goes up fairly quick. The chores are spread across people and the tent goes up, the stove gets set up and you're warm and you're drying out, but it still takes probably an hour or two to get set and then to get dinner on and stuff. And if you're cooking on the stove, that can actually take quite a while versus if you're cooking on like gas stoves for canoeing, that's actually fairly quick. But cooking on those wood stoves, it can it can be a bit slower, right? Like it, and maybe I I have more to learn on that. But uh, you got to get the pots on there, and the fire's got to be rocking, and you don't want to want to uh, overheat the tent while you're trying to cook and you're trying to boil water and stuff, right? So there's all those little things. But you're inside a warm space where you can move around. But then this this type of uh, moving. Same thing, you have to stop earlier. We found we needed three hours. We needed three hours to be able to, we pick a spot, pull up, 
and start working on it. But we're building beds and we're building roofs over our heads and we're putting our shelters up and then collecting the firewood is the big thing. And then the firewood that we collected in, in winter when it's cold is big, as big as your saw can cut. And then we discovered that the nice thing is uh, Adam brought a two-person saw. And uh, that, if you've got two people and you can bring a two-person buck saw or bow saw, yeah, that's the cat's meow. Because, uh, boy, that was way better than sawing these big logs by yourself. And here at the bait site where you set the coyote traps and the weasel traps and there's nothing. Well, I'll do my coyote track in there. There's a weasel box. Nice And then you've got traps over there and over this way. So we'll just collect our traps. It's uh, the end of the season here right away. So, so it goes. I mean, sometimes you have to set these, these bait sites for a while before you see something. But and then other times they get cleaned up right away, but uh, in this case, no luck. So even though the Freeman River is big and wide like this, and it looks like it's a big fat, flat sheet of ice, well it is a big flat sheet of ice, uh, what's really happening is there's just a small channel underneath all this ice, and it's not there's not much water in it, because the Freeman River, uh, we didn't get a lot of rain last fall, it's very low, so the entire width of the running water on the river is likely from about here to there. And that's why you've had such a hard time finding water. If you just go out here and you start chiseling, you chisel through two or three feet of ice and then you just hit rocks. And so we've been uh, having a real hard time finding any open water unless we come to open leads like that. And they weren't beside our camp. but. I think he chiseled too far back there, Tim. Let's try there, pop through there and see. We would have liked to uh, got through the water. It would have been easier than melting snow, but it was more challenging than you think. And even when Tim breaks through here, I bet you there's only like ankle deep and then you're on the rocks, it's that low. like that so it's it's almost like summer now we're dressed down wearing lighter clothes those toboggans all bent up like that look kind of funny <laughs> 